Welcome to Off Hours, a conversation between John Edwards and Chris Manning. So, I owe your lathe an apology. You do. It's uh, it's not very happy with you, John. I am accustomed to using precision lathes that, that have a bed where the everything just slides on and it is squared on its own. Like there's a cross slide or a tool rest or a drill, what have you. You know, the, the bullies and the, the showblins. And I have a, a great amount of faith and trust in, in the trueness of a cross line when it goes on there. Because I've seen the craftsmen at, at Shovelin and the like, you know, and truing that lathe bed with dichem fluid and, and making sure everything's just so. And, and, you know, I started to question that blind faith that I had watching you true up your cross slide on your 10 mil lathe because I, I had never done that i had never bothered squaring up a, a cross slide <laughs> uh and because you had done that and because the cross slide had so so much motion to it you could just position it anywhere you wanted i presumed falsely that there was no radial offset like what i'm accustomed to and it turns out you've uh-huh. told me as i've not been back to the studio since we last recorded that there is actually a a dial indicator in there under under some of the the patina. I could have put more faith in myself to properly uh, put put a bit of an angle on the on the cross slide there. Uh, so, so I apologize both to you and, and to your light. Yeah, you had mentioned that you couldn't uh, you couldn't easily put a, an angle on it and taper the uh, the the pins that we were working on. A subtle angle, but uh, like you absolutely it, yeah. can. Yeah, you absolutely can. There's a there's a nice little scale underneath it, and it's not buried under any grime or anything. It's it's uh, clearly visible, and there's some uh, some lock nuts under there that you just uh, you release, and then you just tap it over, and you get your uh, you get the the exact angle that you want. But yeah, you're right. the The entire cross slide mechanism doesn't have any way of actually truing itself to the to the bed of the lathe, and so I've made a little block which I can put into the uh, the center of the ways sort of um, on the lathe, and I can actually use it to true it up. There is one of my cross slides. I do actually have a little add-on that I can put onto it, and it, you can then push it right up against the bed of the lathe, and it'll sort of true it and put it in the exact same spot every time. Uh, but it interferes with a few other features, so I, I don't really use it all that much. I don't tend to adjust the angle on that lathe very much just because if you do change it, it then has to be trued and um, and made square again. Uh, and I tend to prefer having my cross slide square if it's, you know, in terms of its motion. Uh, I want the two axes of that cross slide to be perpendicular to each other. So I don't tend to modify or change that very much. What I may actually do is that block that I use for getting the cross slide perfectly square on the lathe, I may actually grind one side of it and put a two and a half degree taper on it. And that way I can use one side to make it square to the headstock and the other side to put a very, you know, very small taper onto it. And that way it's very fast for me to, you know, to readjust it and and go from one to the other and just maybe maybe make a couple of those blocks. They don't take me very long to make, so maybe I'll just make a few of those blocks with common angles on them, and uh, that way it's easy for for uh, us to adjust that and, and be able to put a taper on things because that is that is handy every once in a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that would be a very useful aid indeed. In reflecting on this, I, I also realized that since we started Project Minotaur back in September, like cumulatively, we probably spent less than five, maybe six hours together working on this. So I actually have not had that much hands-on time with the lathe uh, to, to really get to know it. And uh, anytime I really had hands-on time with it, you've set it all up and I'm just running the, the other mm. dials. So I, I'm sure I'll get much more familiar with it. You know, maybe once this current lockdown lapses, we'll, we'll get back to it. Uh, but we are still officially in lockdown. Yeah, I, I I don't know, maybe 2025, 2030, sometime later, around then. When, I certainly hope not. Uh, I, I'm done with this. And we're finally out of lockdown. 
It's, it is depressing. Rich and I were talking about that a little the other day as well. It, it is really depressing how little you and I have been able to work on this project in person together. And uh, I'm, I am certainly looking forward to being able to get back to it. Uh, I have been working on some, some video stuff, although I've, I haven't published any more of the Project Minotaur videos on this. It's just the first two that are up so far. I want to reshoot some of the pin making uh, processes that I had shot before. I, I've got a few few things that I want to focus on and uh, and reshoot that. So I uh, I decided to hold off on that and um, and put up a different video instead. Once yeah, once this lockdown's done, we can start pushing forward with this watch and and see if we can get it done. Uh, I'd love to get it done in the first half of this year for sure. Uh, there's there's certainly no reason why we couldn't if uh, if we were able to actually get together regularly. Mm-hmm. And on the video front, the last time we recorded, you had not officially released any of them yet, and you do now have two up on the channel. And uh, I like the mm-hmm. the lighting changes that you you made there in the in the second one. Yeah, I've I've been playing around with lighting. Uh, these first videos are all going to be really rough. When I look back at these ten years from now, I'm going to cringe at just how uh, how rough these are. Uh, everything from the audio to the to the the lighting. Um, I'm I'm trying some different things as I go. One of the things I realized after I had edited the first one and did all the color correction and everything on it, I had left the overhead lights in the studio on, which are all fluorescents. And then I also had some daylight bulbs, um, you know, for my studio lighting, lighting me up and things like that. And it was just a mess. The The colors in it are, are really problematic. And I have, you know, a bunch of things in there that I'm not happy with. So I decided to turn the fluorescence off, which is what I should have done the first time around. It made it a little bit darker and moodier, so I need to get get a little bit more lighting to sort of bring the overall light up. But do that using the same daylight color bulbs that I'm using for my primary key light. Um, and this uh, this third video that I'm just about to hit the publish button on is a review of the Cameron drill press. And that one's even darker than the last one, and I uh, I don't really want to go back and reshoot it. So I'm I'm just sort of living with it, and and uh, I'm not entirely happy with the way that it looks. But you know, at the same time, these are you know, it's not like I've just spent eight hundred million dollars releasing the latest Marvel film, and you know, it's going to be seen by half the planet. It's uh, you know, probably a few thousand people in its lifetime will see this video, and uh, every time I put out a new one, I learn something new. So see what happens with the next one. I'm looking forward to it. Now, in your first video, you did mention Christian Lass and, and his LearnWatchmaking.com video series. And we had the pleasure of speaking mm-hmm. with Christian over the summer, uh, over the course of, of two episodes, which we'll link to in the show notes. And the prototype that he was busy working on back then is now entering its final stages, and he has begun accepting orders for the final timepieces. If you're in the market for an original Christian last, you, you can now put your name on the list. And uh, it's nice to see these these finally coming to light and, and seeing the finished product. We, we've spoken about the incredible engraving work that his wife Hannah has done on the, on the dials and on the movement and uh, that beautiful balance bridge that, that he's crafted there as well. I'm really happy to see these these out there in the world and see the final final versions of them taking shape. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing these, seeing him making a bunch of these and getting them out there. It's, uh, it's exciting to see. I know he's already sold a bunch. Um, he's, he has orders for a number of them. So if you are interested in getting one and getting one sometime soon ish, then I would get in contact with Christian. Um, cause he's, uh, he's certainly getting a lot of attention for them, which is wonderful. Uh, there was a Houdinki article recently on him I think watches by SJX also had a good article about uh, about this watch um, earlier in the week, and he was also on the uh, Independent Thinking podcast on Fithris Radio again recently for the second time, talking about these uh, these finished watches. So certainly getting a lot of attention, which is well deserved. It's uh, and it's great seeing them out there. Yeah, and with ten thousand plus people on the waiting list for Dufour's twenty handmade pieces. It sounds like there's there's quite a market out there for this sort of timepiece. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's nice to see these high end watchmakers, these high end independent watchmakers, getting the attention that they are and getting the interest in in people who have the money to put down on the product. 
it's it's tough to you know when you're when you're making a luxury product like this it's really really tough to to find customers a lot of the time and um you know so it's it's nice to see people actually doing that and then sometimes you'll get people who are like well that's great but i i can buy you know whatever device they're talking about comparing it to for a fraction of the price it's like well yeah you could buy a seiko 5 for a hundred dollars but it's not the same as this watch so it's nice to see people actually stepping up and buying them and uh, and putting the interest in and yeah if you're you know number nine thousand on that that do four list maybe uh maybe go and look at uh, christian's watches instead because uh, you'll get it a lot faster and he learned under the hand of, of do four as well as we we touched on there in our conversation with him so you are you're getting a, a piece of of that knowledge that that Dufour has passed along to Christian mm-hmm. in that handwork and level of finish that that he's applying to these timepieces. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then one last bit of, of follow up: there have been charges laid in the grand theft that we touched on uh, quite a number of episodes ago now. Uh, but the the sad piece of news that has come to light in a, a more recent article is that it sounds like that coin has been melted down. Uh, so all the craftsmanship and and Canadian pride that that went into that particular piece, which thanks to that video that Frank Cooper sent our way a little while back, uh, there truly was a, a lot of Canadian pride uh, poured into that mm. that coin. Um, it is it's sad to to see that the little bit of our, our culture and our our heritage uh, vanquished. I think it was pretty obvious that that wa- that coin was going to be melted down. You've got a hundred kilograms of pure gold. There is no way that you can do anything with that other than melt it down if you want to try and turn around and sell it and and actually make some money off of it. So I think anybody who thought that 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 coin still was was whole was. Uh, was dreaming because there was there was no way that was that was melted down within probably days or weeks of of the theft uh, and the other thing is that this was hardly the f- the only one of them there were what a hundred of them made or something like oh, that i didn't realize there were that many i thought there were only four. Oh no 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 there were more than i'm pretty sure there were more than four of these there, there were a number of them made uh for collectors so it, this wasn't this wasn't a unique coin by any stretch of the imagination uh there were a number of them that went out into the world for collectors so yeah, it's it. I mean, it is. You know, it's unfortunate that that work was was destroyed, but at the same time, it's uh, you know, it's not really surprising considering what happened with it. But it does sound like most of the gentlemen involved have been caught and and are being charged. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have had the pleasure of seeing one of these in, in person, and uh, it was mm-hmm. quite the the sight to behold. Well, I I think there's one still on display in at the Canadian Mint here in Ottawa. Is there? I have never actually toured the mint so um, i can't oh. say with any degree of veracity okay if you're if you're in ottawa and you have the opportunity to do it the uh, canadian mint tour here is actually quite good uh, down on sussex drive and they they don't mint any of the normal currency here in, in ottawa uh, that's done out west but the uh, they do a lot of the high-end uh, commemorative coins here in ottawa and i'm pretty sure that they've got one of these on display there if you're into geocaching my favorite geocache in the city is actually right behind the, the Canadian <laughs> Mint. Uh, so that's a, a fun one to to go and hunt for, should you go for a tour. Um, I have been meaning to take a tour of the Mint. I've just not gotten around to it. I've, yeah. I've been waiting until my kids are a bit older to be able to to show them. I was going to say, bring the kids along, yeah. Yeah. It, it's fun, uh, you know, seeing seeing what happens and seeing how it works and whatnot. And uh, it's, uh, it, it is a good tour. So the year of building part two has been going fairly well for you. You've released two videos now, a third one's in the pipeline, and you've also recently completed uh, another stand-up desk for, for your office at home. This is, yeah, this is, this seems to be a, a theme for me is uh, building, building tables. Well, okay, T- full disclosure, tables seem to be the bane of our existence at uh, the studio. Between Rich and me, uh, we've probably made 8,000 tables in the last year. I, I'm... It might be a slight under-exaggeration. We may have built more than 8,000 tables. It, it seems that every time we turn around, we need to build another table for something else. And uh, there was one point where that was basically all that was being made in the studio were, were tables. And 
I haven't had a home office for a little while now. In fact, actually, since I moved everything to the studio, I haven't had a home office. And I wanted to get one back up and running here, mostly to be able to do video editing so I could do that in the evenings when I wasn't uh, wasn't at the studio. And I had brought my desk into the studio, so I needed something here uh, to be able to work on and thought I'd make another standing desk since I, I've been enjoying using those between the watchmaker's bench that I've got at, uh, at work and, and previous sort of standing t- desks I've had for computers. I've, uh, I've definitely liked them. And so I decided to, uh, to knock together another one. And this was using some uh, leftover walnut from my watchmaker's bench build. I was able to build a nice little tabletop and, um, keyboard shelf underneath. I didn't put a keyboard drawer in. I decided to put a static shelf, but when you've got a standing desk, it's nice because you can just easily move it up and down and adjust it as necessary. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm pretty pleased with it so far. It's uh, it's worked out reasonably well. And this one is is quite an elaborate IKEA hack. How do you find the the IKEA standing desk stacks up against the the Jarvis that you used for your watchmaker's bench? This is the higher end standing desk that IKEA sells. They they have a couple of powered st- standing desks. I think they've got a a manual one where you you crank a lever in it and it goes up and down and I think they've also got a version of this desk where you can manually change where the pin locations are on the legs to to adjust it but this is one of the two powered ones that they've gotten it's the the higher end one and so far I'm reasonably happy with it it's uh, it's not quite as full featured as the Jarvis is in terms of the control panel that's on it this has just got a simple up down lever on it and if you want more functionality than that then you need to use their Uh, iOS app to uh, connect up to the Bluetooth device in the desk and that'll allow you to to set specific heights if you want to do that. Uh, The nice thing about the Jarvis is that it it actually has a little keypad with memory buttons on it so you've got four positions that you can go to quite easily. So I do like that about the, the Jarvis and the Jarvis is certainly more stable and can handle more weight uh, which was a consideration for the watchmaker's bench, but not a consideration for here. Uh, I don't have anywhere near as much stuff going on on it, and I'm not doing the same kind of work where it's going to get shifted around and moved and everything. So that that was less of a concern for me. So this has been good enough. It's certainly stable enough, which is good. I know the the lower end IKEA standing desk is not great. It's pretty flimsy, and I know the motors in it have a lot of problems. So that was why I avoided that. Uh, but the other thing with this desk uh, from Ikea, I just picked up the the base and then made my own tabletop. And uh, it is also significantly less expensive than the Jarvis, which was uh, a consideration for this one because I didn't really want to spend the the same money that I had on the uh, the watchmaker's bench when I didn't need all the features that it had. And from a passive user perspective, I would actually have preferred if the the Jarvis had, had buttons that were always visible. I f- found it a little... Non intuitive, mm. uh, having it black out like that, that in the way that it does. And uh, also the fact that, that not the entire surface is, is capacitive either, because all the, the triggers are, are capacitive uh, touch input. So uh, it, it took a bit of getting used to for me to, to operate that correctly. And yeah. there's also the, the issue of, of, of false or accidental triggers on the, the capacitive buttons if you happen to the brush by it or, or touch it in just the wrong way. I ended up moving the controller back a little bit, insetting it back a little bit so that I, I didn't brush against it quite as much. Uh, but you're right, the fact that the display turns off as quickly as it does is a little bit annoying. It's a powered, you know, constantly powered device. It's not as if there's a battery to save on it. I'm not sure why they were so aggressive with the, um, the timeout on the display. I don't know, maybe the display technology tends to burn in or something. I, I don't know. That would probably be my only complaint about the Jarvis was just that display and how quickly it turns off. Uh, that's probably my biggest complaint about it. And then with with the the other thing with the IKEA one is that it, you know it's got this paddle for moving up and down. It is nowhere near as responsive as the Jarvis. The Jarvis I can very easily dial it in and get it exactly where I want. I find with the IKEA one it tends to there tends to be a bit of a a pause when you start moving it in a direction and a bit of a lag when you you know when you stop. So. It's it's a little more challenging to get it dialed in exactly where you want. I haven't tried the the mobile device or the mobile app yet, so I, I don't know how good that is and how how accurate it is. Maybe that's a, a better way of going about it. I don't tend to move my desks a huge amount, uh, so 
you know, maybe that would be, uh, that would be the way to go. But the little paddle thing is on, on here is not spectacular. And despite the shortcomings of the, the one from Jarvis, it is still far superior to, to the, the paddle mover the, on this thing. Well, once you get your first M series based Mac in there, you'll be able to run their iPhone app right on your desktop, which will be a, a nice perk. <laughs> and you can just control the height of your desk from your, your keyboard or your mouse. Well, that's assuming that they haven't uh, they haven't locked it out from being used on the Mac, because I know a lot of developers are are saying, "Nope, sorry, you're not allowed using that on the on the Mac." I'm looking at you, Instagram. And Apple has officially locked out the ability to sideload apps that that were not allowing this. Mm. Uh, so that, that is that is unfortunate as well. There's really no proper workaround uh, to to get an iOS app that is is not available through the Mac App Store onto an M1-based Mac. Now, looping back to the the Jarvis from a, a power user perspective, because this isn't an area that I have, have touched on or have any experience with, actually programming the functions there using the, the entry pad. What's that experience like? It's very, very simple. Um, you move it to the, to the height that you want, press the memory, um, the M button that's on there, click on the the number one through four that you want to assign it to and you're done it, it takes seconds to to get it to the uh, you know to program that memory feature that you want so it's very very easy to to use that's a, a nice perk we've certainly come a, a long way from the the hydraulic hand pumped watchmakers benches uh, that, <laughs> that i've used in in years past or, or indeed even further from the ones where you'd actually have to get down on the floor and, and spin little feet on the bottom to get everything leveled and, and raised. And actually, that's what truly surprised me and impressed me with the Jarvis is that most watchmaking benches are are quite high. So it, it makes sense to, to use a, a standing desk for this sort of utility because mm -hmm. the, the height that you would want a watchmaker's bench at is not far off of the height that you'd want a standing desk at. So it it's nice to be yeah. able to get the best of, of both worlds. You can have a, a sitting bench, you can have a, a standing bench if you want, uh, but then you can also have it as a watchmaker's bench. But what blew my mind the first time you demoed <laughs> your watchmaking bench to me is that not just me, who's notably shorter than you are, but, but you could actually use your watchmaker's bench as a standing watchmaker's bench. So, so you could ditch the chair and actually raise the bench height high enough that it would be at the appropriate height for you to do watch work while standing up. Uh, and the stability of the bench was still phenomenal at that height as well. So it's just truly remarkable. I had no idea that standing <laughs> desks could go that high. It was really shocking to me the first time I tried it out. And I, I have to say it's probably three or four inches too short for me to use sort of for for any length of time as a watchmaker's bench while standing it's just a little bit too short for me so you're you're about five inches shorter than me and that's probably just just about perfect i think this this bench is is probably somewhere around four or five inches too short for me to use comfortably as a standing watchmaker's bench all the time although it wouldn't be very difficult if i added a little you know a little um platform or something like that a la uh, roger smith and the way he's uh, he's designed his benches so i could probably get away with doing that without too much effort uh, but it you know for short periods of time i have actually used it as a watchmaker's bench and done that standing up and it's and it's been great it's it's nice to have that flexibility and be able to do things and frankly i you know there's there's other things that i do with it I, i'm i'm regularly working on it and doing tasks that are closer to, let's say, a jeweler's bench kind of task. So things like using um, using a file or a sanding stick or something like that, um, you know, to start doing um, angling the edges of plates and whatnot, or just improving the surface finish of a plate. And those tasks are often better suited at a height that is lower, something closer to what a standard desk would be. And you don't want to be doing that with your arms up in the air like you normally have them for watchmaking. Um, you need sort of a different type of stability for that. 
And so it's nice to be able to just quickly move the table down and get it to exactly the height that I want. You know, I've got a, I've, I've put a, one of the, the little GRS plates on the front of it that allows me to drop on all my accessories from that. So uh, I can go back and forth between my jeweler's bench and this, and I've got things like a, a, a jeweler's pin, you know, bench pin on there. I've got uh, flat plates that are very convenient for using my jeweler saw and actually doing cut work on it. But then I've also got, uh, you know, pl- holders for holding things like rings, like specialized holders for rings and things like that, which I can also use for holding, you know, small components like a, like a bridge and be able to work on it. So the fact that I can go back and forth between my jeweler's bench and the watchmaker's bench, I can get it at exactly the height that I need it at. I don't have to swap around and, you know, and, and only work at one bench or the other for, for certain tasks is really great. And then when I need to do some watch work and I actually need to, to get it to the proper height, pull the bench pin off or whatever accessory I've got on there, then I can get nice and close to the bench and get it to the height that I need. And it's, uh, it's brilliant for that. So I, I clearly underestimated just how much taller you are than me, because at its max height, it was too <laughs> tall for me to use comfortably as a, a watchmaker's bench. So it so must be you know, okay. like a two to three inch disparity there between between the, the two of us in terms of our, our optimal height. It's probably two, yeah. maybe three inches too high for me at its highest height and it feels <laughs> you know, a few inches too low for you still. So uh, yeah. I, I thought you would have been able to use it. And well, clearly you have used it, just not, not comfortably for yeah. an extended period of time. Whereas I could work pretty much all day at that bench if I were to dial it into the, the optimal height for me to work. The big problem I notice with it is the the optimal working distance f- for my loop. It's a little bit too low. If I'm if I'm doing something that doesn't require a loop necessarily or a very low powered loop, then I can get away with it. It's not a problem from you know from an ergonomics of my body in terms of where my arms are and things like that. It's not it's not so bad for that. It's really a question of of how close I need to get for uh, you know for my uh, my loop. And I find that I have to lean over a little bit too much if I want to get it to the, um, you know, if I'm using a, a higher, higher magnification loop, I need to get a little bit closer. And so I, I tend to be leaning down a little too much or leaning forward a little too much. But yeah, I, I could do a lot of work like that if I, you know, for instance, if I was reassembling watches or whatever, and I don't need the loop for most of that work, that'd be fine. And the walnut you've used on both of these benches is is stunning really beautiful wood lovely grain you've you've got going on there and a, a great finish on it too you've, you've done a, an awesome job i i'm incredibly pleased with this i i'm i'm a real sucker for walnut uh, our first house we had uh walnut floors throughout the entire first floor of the house that were absolutely stunning and i i still miss those floors and uh, i've so i've been a huge fan of the the look of walnut and I knew that when I was making custom benches that I wanted to do walnut for them because it is hard enough that it can be used as a as a, a reasonable bench wood. Uh, it's a little pricey, but at the same time, in in our area, it's really not that much different in price from uh, something like a hard maple, which is what a lot of benches are made out of. A lot of uh, workbenches are made out of. So, and, and I don't, you know, hard maple is great and it's, you know, it's a, a great material for making benches out of, but it's also pretty plain. And I, I figure if I'm going to be sitting there for hours and hours at a time, looking at a desk or a bench, I may as well make it look nice and, and, uh, turn it, uh, turn it into something that's, uh, that I appreciate and that I enjoy instead of just having this, this sort of large beige block in front of me. I would not have guessed this was an Ikea desk looking at a, a photo of it. And in terms of the finish itself that's on here, uh, this is a finish that Rich actually introduced me to. It's a Rubio mono coat, and I believe it started its life as a floor finish. And it, as the name suggests, it's a single coat uh, finish that you put on. And it's been brilliant. It's a sort of a low gloss finish, which is nice. It's a not quite a matte, but it's a um, you know it's not certainly not glossy at all, which is good. You don't get reflections off of the lights from it, and it's uh, it's nice and durable. And I've been um, yeah I've been super pleased with it. So if you're if you're looking for a simple finish for uh, a bench 
or a, a table or whatever it is, this Rubio monocoat has been excellent. Uh, we, we've been very happy with it. Yeah, my, my brother referenced that when we had him on the, the show here as one of his, his favorite finishes for wood as well. So I'm, I'm not surprised to learn that yeah. that's what you used. And I, and I know they do have some tinted versions as well. This is the clear one, uh, just the sort of the natural one, just obviously because I wanted the, uh, the wood grain to come out and, and, uh, be, be prevalent. So, uh, and it does a great job of making the grain pop on this wood. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, super pleased with it. And you got to play with your, your plasma cutter for this build as well. For my keyboards, I've always been a keyboard drawer user. I like the the ability to be able to move the drawer in and out and get it out of the way. And most of my keyboard drawers have had the ability to adjust the height of them, which is more important when the whole table doesn't move up and down. Uh, But one of the problems with standing desks is that they do tend to have this bar that runs across the middle of them. And it gets in the way of the slide for your, uh, your, your keyboard drawer. So I needed something uh, as an alternative to that because I don't like having the keyboard and mouse at the same level as the, the, the tabletop surface. So I just made some little angled brackets that are holding the shelf in place. And I haven't decided if I'm going to keep them, keep it like this. I think there may be a little bit too much distance between the tabletop and the shelf. I think it's about six inches right now. So I may, uh, I may actually shrink that down a little bit, maybe drop it down to about four inches, uh, just to get the, get it a little bit closer to the tabletop surface. But, um, yeah, so far I'm reasonably pleased with it. I think it's, uh, I think it's worked out pretty well. Well, having custom made them, it's nice that you have the ability to tweak and refine the design at your leisure. It really is. It's, it's nice having that ability to, to quickly iterate and change on things and and in fact, the first version of these that I did, I, I really wasn't happy with, and I didn't even need to bend them and install them on the table to know that I was I was unhappy with them. So I, I was able to make some quick changes on the fly to it and, and go. And yeah, it's it's great having access to these kinds of tools and, and being able to do stuff. And, you know, it's it's frustrating when when we we're looking for a tool that we don't actually have anymore. Uh, it, and that's becoming less and less common. And that's nice, too, that you're able to make a, a keyboard tray a keyboard shelf that is as expansive as it is because i think you'd be hard pressed to find something off the shelf that is that large and that gives you that much space for your keyboard and having your mouse as well as your your trackpad off to the other side and you've still got room to spare if you, you want to say have a notepad on there or, or anything else it really is nice having the ability to customize it as much as i have and you're right there's no way i'd i'd have been able to find an off the shelf keyboard drawer solution i would have needed to use some kind of sliders, you know, just drawer sliders and, and built a, a keyboard drawer using sort of traditional drawer sliders. If I wanted to do this, this, this one is, I want to say it's just shy of four feet long. And I think it's about 11 inches deep. So it would have been challenging to find a solution to this problem if I had been looking for an actual drawer that was working. Uh, and then the whole desk itself is six feet long and 30 inches wide. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, it's a nice large surface. I don't have to worry too much about, uh, about filling it up. Uh, I still need to make a few changes to the way that things are set up, but it's, uh, yeah, it's been pretty pleasant. In terms of width, your, your keyboard tray is is wider than the desk I'm sitting at right now. (laughs) Uh, Well, and it's wider than my desk that's at the studio. And that's one of the reasons why it's as big as it is, because I'm, (laughs) I'm uh, really unhappy with the, uh, the, how small my desk at, uh, at the studio is. So I've had that desk for a very long time and it has served me well, but it's, it was also something that I purchased originally when we were in a very small one bedroom flat in Ottawa, you know, that was like 500 square feet and I needed a desk to be able to work from home. And uh, so I needed something small that could actually fit into the, into the place. So that's why it was, uh, it was as small as it was, but I'm not living in a, in a tiny little 500 square foot flat anymore. So I, I figured it was time to get a, a proper size desk. And back in the day, Working from home as as you were like that, or or even your your later office jobs, uh, you made quite extensive use of some handy automation tools uh, on the computer that helped to accelerate and and streamline your workflows. And as part of the year of permaculture, that's something I've recently dove into as well, just trying to reduce the number 
of repetitive tasks uh, that I'm doing. Um, normally, I've approached this sort of thing through actually physically coding things or writing little scripts or plugging things into services like if this, then that. But I've never delved into using automation software on my Mac, apart from the built-in automator. Um, so I, I looked at a number of different apps. So one of the key things I, I wanted to address most recently and, and set up workflows to take tasks off my plate and, and be able to spend less time on them and, and, and set up <laughs> that sense of permaculture where, you know, do it once and, and just have it be done. And then with a flick of a couple of keystrokes, have it spit out, say, paragraphs of text for me, you know, handling things like customer support for, for my apps much more elegantly mm. rather than having to, to go through every little bit or, or tweak things here and there. I had been using the, the built-in text expansion features that are available on iOS and, and Mac OS. Uh, but those can only carry you so far. And I started looking at programs like Text Expander, which I, I know you are, are well acquainted with, and the fact that you can mm-hmm. nest workflows and and have different text expansions call on other text expansions and embed snippets within each other and do fancy things uh, with the clipboard. So I explored a number of these. And the nice thing about them is you can say copy and paste a number of things in a row. And you can have this email magically formed that will have the customer's name and it will reference them a number of times throughout the the email at at key points. And you can have the the exact issue spelled out and, and addressed have that hinted back to a number of times throughout the email as well. And uh, just make it seem really personal, despite being effectively put together by a little robot or a little program that's doing it all. Back in the day when I was doing IT work, uh, things like Text Expander and Hazel and whatnot, uh, they saved my life and saved me from literally millions of keystrokes uh, over the years in terms of you know, emails that I had to write and and repetitive emails that I had to write. And I, I do remember people watching me replying back to customers or sending out um, onboarding emails and things like that. And, and just they were utterly shocked at how quickly I could create these, uh, you know, these emails that seemed to be personalized and customized for exactly what they needed. And and get them out there in the world. And if if you're in any kind of a job where you need to do, uh, you need to write the same things over and over again, the, these tools are just so powerful. Even if you don't need all of the features of them, even if you just sort of scratch the surface of them, they can still save you a huge amount of time and pain. Recently, I, you know, I'm working on, on my taxes right now, and I, I had to generate a bunch of, uh, PDFs from PayPal for purchases that I had made. And of course, the PayPal interface is not spectacular when it comes to generating those those invoices in terms of how they've formatted the file names and things like that. So I, you know, I created a, a Hazel script that automatically digs into the file and pulls all the relevant details out of the file and renames it based on on the information that's in there. And it took me, you know, it took me some time to get it working properly, but at the same time, now I never have to think about it again. Every time I save one of those, uh, one of those invoices, it just automatically updates the file name and sticks it in the correct folder. And it's, uh, you know, it really does save you a lot of time and pain over the years if you're if you can find tools like this that that work for you. Yeah, I've met the developer of of Hazel, Paul Kim. He's a really nice guy, and Hazel is one of the the apps I was looking at in, in all of this as well because i've been meaning to try it for for years and i've just never never taken yeah. the plunge that yeah. particular setup that you did there with hazel i wasn't aware it was capable of doing that so how, how exactly yeah are you doing that hazel is designed as a tool primarily to manipulate files in your file system and it, it is really effective at doing that it can do everything from copying files into a particular location so 
I when I you know if I rip a a movie from a DVD or whatever and I've and I've generated a, a file that I want to be able to put onto my uh, my video server here in the house, it can automatically sort it and put it into the correct folder and and do all the things that it needs to do and and it's really convenient for that. But it's just doing that based on the file name. The nice thing with Hazel is that you can then tell it to go even deeper into the file and do things like find out, uh, you know, information based on the metadata that's in it. Or if you're, you know, in this case with a PDF, the text of the actual file, it's able to go through. I also have similar things set up for my, my banking statements because, again, my banking statements have these horrible file names that come up and you can't tell what the heck it is. And so I have it set up to automatically rename it. It it goes in and it finds certain uh, certain things, so I can tell it to look for, uh, you know, there's let's say there's a the word invoice and then a colon and then a thirteen digit number, uh, which is a combination of letters and numbers, and you can tell it that thirteen digit ID that's in there is the transaction ID, and so you can tell it to use that as part of your file name and whatnot. Um, so you can you can give it some really good information like that. It's it's incredible what you can do with these tools. If you're ever looking for uh, a good source of information on on how to do some of the stuff and some more advanced things, and even just how to do some of the basic things, David Sparks has been doing this sort of thing for years. He's been running a podcast called uh, Mac Power Users for many many years now. And this is the kind of thing that he's discussed for a long time. He's got a more recent podcast called The Automators where he's been diving into some of this stuff. And he has a couple of really good uh, tutorials that you can pay for that go into this stuff in more detail, but in a more uh, you know, structured way, uh, showing that off with his, um, with his field guides into how to do some of this stuff. And if, if you think that this is the kind of thing that, that you're interested in, he is a great source of information for this stuff and and really is um really is outstanding when it comes to teaching about this kind of information so there are four main applications that uh i've dug into and and played around with and experimented with over the the past month or so uh, trying to to dial this in and eliminate some tedium and, and get some workflows in place and uh these were text expander and hazel two of which we've mentioned so far as well as Keyboard Maestro and Alfred. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of the text expansion type tasks, Text Expander was the the front runner for me for a number of weeks. And and I used it and and set up a bunch of, of different workflows and I was really, really happy with it. But I was still dabbling in and exploring uh, a lot of these other apps as well. And one of the use cases that I wanted to throw at, at Hazel, because I've been meaning to use it just to automate tidying up the the downloads folder and stuff like that, just stuff I've I've never gotten around to, and it just sort of piles up and, and becomes a mess, or like the, the desktop, which the way I saw my desktop issue is I've, I've just taken my desktop and I've got a new folder that's just called holding area, and I dumped everything in there, and <laughs> holding area is my new desktop. So I have a nice clean... So you've just moved the problem from one folder to another folder is what you're saying? Exactly. I swept it, swept it away. There's no reason for me to use the desktop the way that I do. And to, it's just a temporary mm -hmm. holding area and it's just become the default because it's the desktop. But I never access things from the desktop. So why not just have a folder? So that was just a, a mentality shift. And I do go through and, and tidy things up. And I have all my screenshots set to go into the holding area now rather than to the desktop and I'll, I'll clean those out from time to mm -hmm. time. So I'm actually better at tending to the holding area than I am, am to the desktop, at least for the time being. Uh, but these are the sort of tasks I was thinking of, of using Hazel for it. Another one was monitoring our shared folder for when you upload an episode. I was, I was thinking of having that automatically pipe it up to a server or building a little podcast feed with that so that I can actually listen to the the initial draft edit in a, a podcast player rather than listening to mm -hmm. it via the, the file system or some other means like like Dropbox or, or what have you. Although we've migrated away from Dropbox, except when our current system fails and we, and we fall back to Dropbox. Uh, so these are the sort of tasks 
I was thinking of addressing with Hazel, and I, I did dabble and, and mess around with that a little bit. Um, and there were some other apps as well that uh, that I flirted with, and I, I never actually took the plunge on because I, I wasn't comfortable giving them the range of access to my system that these sorts of apps require. Mm. You do have to give them some accessibility access where they can be reading your keystrokes and things like that. So you want to make sure that you are using a reputable app uh, that can be trusted. And uh, from all that I can see, the, the apps that I've mentioned seem to be very trustworthy. They have a great track record. They've been around for years. Huge corporations use them. So they, they seem to be very well vetted. So I, I don't have any qualms or, or issues that way. Alfred is, is more of a, a, a spotlight replacement for the the mac but they also do some snippets Mm -hmm. and things like that uh but it very quickly felt of contention for me simply because you are limited in nesting snippets to one nested snippet so if you have a snippet of text that references another snippet you can't then embed that in another snippet and expect that reference snippet to to be referenced whereas text expander handles all of this beautifully. Then there was also Keyboard Maestro, which uh, I have to say had a bit of a learning curve to it for me. And uh, I was bumbling along quite a bit there at the beginning. But David Sparks actually uh, does the the voiceover for the promo uh, video for Keyboard Maestro. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> and Hazel. Oh, he does the Hazels too. Of course. I'm pretty sure he's done. I'm pretty sure he's done the Hazel ones, and maybe even the text expander ones. Yeah, Dave. David has his his fingers in a lot of pies when it comes to automation. Yes, I didn't notice the any official promo video for for text expander. Okay, and with Hazel, having had a number of conversations with Paul, I, I knew more or less the the gist of what it can do. Although I didn't know that it could do yeah. things as as fine grained and, and deep into the system. Uh, as what you're doing with with PDFs, I knew it could do mm-hmm. things like that with a lot of media files, uh, but I didn't know you could actually throw regex statements at a, at a PDF and and have it pull information out that way, which is is really powerful. So I may come back to to visiting it, but this is actually an area where Keyboard Maestro also started to win me over as well because I, I could trigger workflows and and actions on folder events. So if a if a folder changes or something's added. Uh, I can have a, a regex statement, look at that, see what kind of file it is, see how it's named, mm. and then perform an action on that, whether it's moving it around, opening it up, throwing it at another app. Uh, so it's really powerful that way. But with the, the text expansion, I found I was really just bumbling along with, with Keyboard Maestro. I was, I was fighting the system. I was trying to get it to work the way the text expander was working for me out of the box and I, I just kept falling over myself trying to get things done and yeah. ended up with these really cumbersome workflows with multiple pulls from the the clipboard and then multiple pastes and it was messy and then i discovered variables and it turned out i i was holding it wrong huh. variables are what unlocked keyboard maestro for me and all of a sudden i could create mm. incredible text snippets with a, a single paste into the system and none of this back and forth to the, the clipboard and being able to pull multiple things in from the clipboard, diving way back into the history as far as I wanted and comparing hmm. things using regex statements as well. And for listeners who don't know what a regex statement is, it is just short for a irregular expression. So this is just a a pattern that you can offer to a computer to say if a given body of text or a series of characters match this pattern, then that's what I want. And here's what I want you to do with that. Um, so I've settled on, on Keyboard Maestro and it is my my one hmm. automation app to rule them all for the time being. And, and that may change down the road, but I'm really happy with the workflows and setups I've been able to implement with it in just these past few weeks. And uh, I think my my year of permaculture and eliminating a lot of these tedious tasks and making things much simpler is 
it's working out great already. I mean, even things like, you know, making sure that our, our titles for the show are, are title cased. We've been using titlecase.com for that, but even titlecase.com will fall down on things like an abbreviation of a watch brand like JLC or, or AP. Sure. You end up with a capital J and then a lowercase LC because it doesn't know what JLC is. It's challenging sometimes finding the tool that you want to use. And I have played a little bit with Keyboard Maestro and and never really dug into it deep enough to to like it. And frankly, the combination of Text Expander and Hazel have been able to do everything that I've needed to do quite easily. So I, I haven't really dug much further into Keyboard Maestro than than uh, you know than just sort of scratching at it a little bit and seeing seeing how well it would work but once you get these tools up and running though it is just such a dream to to have them and it really is shocking how I, i've got a you know i've got a computer at work that isn't set up yet with my text expander snippets and it drives me crazy because i'm constantly typing these keystrokes which are supposed to trigger things and they're not and it, I keep banging my head against the wall because it's, you know, just simple things, even simple things like signature blocks and stuff at the, at the end of emails. Uh, I have all that stuff pre-programmed into text expander. So I, I've, I've got to get that computer because I'm using it more and more. I've got to get that computer set up properly with my text expander snippets and things like Hazel have saved my, my bacon so many times. Uh, things like um, DaVinci Resolve, which I use for editing video. It has a folder where it goes and and renders and caches a bunch of um, a bunch of stuff on each project, and those those cache files can get quite large, and it never deletes them on its own. So you have to manually delete those files. Well, I, at one point I had a terabyte and a half of cache files sitting on my computer, uh, you know, from sort of a year of of editing video, and uh, that's the sort of thing where Hazel comes in and it I can take it go through that folder and tell it, you know, it checks it multiple times a minute. It says if this file is more than six months old, just delete it. It's not necessary. If I need to go back into that old project file, Resolve will automatically recache it for me. So it may take a little bit longer to, to open it, but I save a huge amount of disk space in the process. So it is, uh, these, these sorts of things can be super useful. So if you've ever run into a problem like that, where either you're repeating the same things over and over again, or you've had your downloads folder get out of control or uh, you know your your desktop is full of screenshots which you're you know you've been taking um, this this sort of thing can can really make your life easier and just automate those things that uh, those pain points that you've you've had on your computer mm -hmm. absolutely and it is astounding how quickly you adapt to using them and for instance with the the title case rather than me copying a piece of text and then opening up my browser, navigating the title case and then pasting it in there and then copying it back on and then going back to the the application I was in and then repasting it in. It's, it's now just a matter of, of highlighting the title and hitting a combination of keystrokes, actually just a, a hotkey. So just I'm just control mm -hmm. shift T and that'll automatically take that and convert it and repaste it exactly where it is in title case form accounting for these these nuanced or obscure watch terms and things like that uh, that that wouldn't otherwise have been accounted for that I'd have to go back in and, and edit anyway. And while I built this for our show, I've actually gone on and started using this other places that I, I wouldn't even have really thought to use it, but it's become handy and, and just second nature for me to very quickly be able to, to do that. And that's just one example of more than a dozen workflows like this that I, I've been able to to set up. It's it's also kind of fun because if you look at something like Text Expander, it will tell you your statistics of how many minutes or hours you've saved because of the work that it's done for you instead of you doing it. So this MacBook Pro, which I picked up in I guess November of 2019, so it's uh, it's a little over a year now. Thanks to te thanks to Text Expander, I have saved more than a week of typing at this point. I'm not surprised to hear it all. Yeah, uh, so it, it really is shocking when uh, when I think about that, and I I didn't even realize that I had saved that much time doing it. It's uh, it's that's terrifying. 
Mm -hmm. And Text Expander and Hazel are a perfectly fine combination. And that's probably where I would have ended up landing if I hadn't persevered and, and kept banging my head against Keyboard Maestro to, to try and get it to bend to my will. Whereas, you know, I need, I need to accommodate myself to its sort of golden path of functionality. Uh, but it was actually the David Sparks uh, tutorials uh, and, and videos and, and things that, that he has put out into the world uh, that made me want to persevere in that and, and get it to work. And, and I'm glad that I got through that initial learning curve and that I'm now in, at the point now with it where I can get it to do what I want it to do and, and it works out beautifully. And the other thing too worth worth noting is that uh, Text Expander um, is a subscription service now. It's perfectly reasonable the price they're asking. It's absolutely worth the the three dollars a month or whatever it is they were asking, in my opinion. And if you are vehemently opposed to subscriptions, they actually do still offer Text Expander Five as a dedicated download that is still available for purchase for use on on private networks. Uh, but you're not likely going to get continued support for for that particular version of, of Text Expander. Whereas the the subscription service, you're going to get support on the Mac app. You can use it on Windows. You can use it as a plugin in in Gmail and a number of other places that their their service is provided. Uh, so that is a, a great service and a tool. And I take it you must be using the the older version, Text Expander Five, then. Because I think with the subscription service, your your snippets would have all magically synced over the cloud. Yeah, I don't use a uh, I don't use the subscription version of it. I'm I'm on I'm still on version five, and uh, I'm perfectly happy with where uh, where it's at. I haven't needed to uh, to do that, and it's it's not a question of um, of syncing. Um, the the previous version did actually support syncing. You just have to point it to the correct folder. Um, well, the first thing you have to do is actually install it on the computer, which is, uh, you know, step zero, which I haven't done yet. <laughs> and then, uh, just point it at my I iCloud drive. Cause I've got it, um, I've got it backing up to my iCloud drive. So the iCloud deals with all the syncing. Um, I, I didn't find a, I haven't found enough benefit in what they're offering with the, uh, the subscription version to, uh, to make it worth my time to, to get that. And then keyboard maestro is is still just a, a one-time purchase for the current version. And then mm -hmm. that stayed and true long-lived model of then paying an upgrade price for, for the next version and what have you as, as they're released. And one other area that, that won me over with Keyboard Maestro is they have got OCR support built in as well. And I haven't flexed this too much, but I, I can see a number of areas where this will come in handy for me too. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to the ways that I can automate my digital life further in 2021 with Keyboard Maestro. Now, if you're looking for uh, more of my lovely voice, and I know all of you love listening to my lovely voice, then uh, you can uh, actually find an interview that I did with uh, the fine folks over at Fithris Radio, uh, Roman and Adam from the Independent Thinking Podcast interviewed me a little while back. I guess it was uh, back in January, the beginning of, beginning of January. I don't remember now. It's been a, it's been a little while since we, we recorded. Anyway, uh, that episode is about to go live and I'm not sure the exact date that it's going live. Uh, Roman's still editing the, uh, the show, but uh, it should be live either this week or next week, I'm hoping. And uh, we got into talking about a bunch of different things, including some of the work that I do and why I do some of what I'm doing in terms of teaching and things like that. Uh, if you haven't checked out the independent thinking show before it is excellent. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Christian's been on it a few times now, including very recently. It's actually, they've actually had a, a number of really great independent watchmakers on there. And that tends to be what they focus on is independent watchmaking, either the collecting side of it or the, the actual making side of it. And it's worth listening to if you're interested in that. So, uh, give that a listen. We will have a link to it uh, in the show notes once it actually goes live. And if you're looking to be able to catch it and not have to wait for our show notes, then you can go over and subscribe to uh, the Fifth Wrist Radio podcast feed and it will show up in your feed when it gets published. Thanks for listening to Off Hours. 
You can find detailed show notes at offhours.show. If you'd like to keep up to date with the show, follow us on Twitter, at Off Hours. John can be found on Twitter at Under the Loop, and Chris can be found on Twitter and Instagram at Silver underscore Hand.